We have one last panel before the break, um, and it is one of the best. Um, philanthropy, as you all know, has an outsized voice as well as outsized influence in how we move this forward. And the reality is if we're going to accelerate the fight against poverty in America, philanthropy will probably be the leading voice in a, in, a, in a moment in which there's not a lot of political coalescence around where we go. That actually requires, I mean, it sounds like a great sexy job. I've done some big jobs in philanthropy and the reality is it is, it's an exciting job but it also requires several very key and critical characteristics. A sense of deep responsibility and commitment to the work that you do, um, humility, intelligence, and often humor. Um, and in that, I went out to sort of select the people who I think best represent those qualities. You will hear now from Emmett Carson, Daniel Lurie, Meg Garlinghouse, and Larry Kramer. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. We have the tough position of being right before the break on the last day at 3 o'clock. So I am going to try and inject a lot of humor and a little bit of controversy into this conversation. And I have a lot of practice in moderating conversations that are controversial because I grew up with three younger brothers. And the little known fact is um, fake news was actually not just recently invented. It was invented 30 years ago at the family dinner in Topeka, Kansas. My brothers would say anything to make their point. I don't think these guys are going to do that, but we'll, we'll make sure we're keeping them in check. Um, OK, so I'm going to start with a few um, remarks and then um, lob up some questions for the three esteemed panelists. But before I do, one fun thing that we do at LinkedIn is we say, what's not on your LinkedIn profile to sort of bring these, these individuals to life. So Larry, a fun fact that's on his LinkedIn profile is that he used to drive a cab in New York City. I was pretty impressed with that. Fun fact about Daniel is that he used to be the AV guy for the Bill Bradley campaign. Apparently he was not so good at that. <laughs> and uh, probably the most interesting fact is about Emmett Carson, who not just used to deliver what they call paper newspapers, but he actually would sit in a kiosk, from what I understand. You had to drive up to the kiosk and then grab the newspaper. It's more like a shack. A but. shack, a shack. <laughs> anyway, so the panel is called um, Philanthropy as a Catalyst. And I'm actually going to put a big question mark at the end of that, Philanthropy as a Catalyst question mark. Um, and the reason is, and I'm going to include myself as a corporate philanthropist in this conversation, is I don't know whether we've actually done a great job <clears throat> as a philanthropy sector in making some big bets and in investment in technology that the sector so desperately needs to make those big bets and make some disruptive change. I do think we've done a great job at investing in some extraordinary people and ideas, but those ideas have literally shown up as those 1,000 points of light, if that's a reference anyone remembers. Um, but they're just light. They've never really ignited into any sort of disruptive change. And I think there's two reasons. One is the lack of capital. Um, the philanthropy sector is actually tiny relative to the government. That Steve Ballmer referenced the government as being the biggest philanthropic entity we have. Um, just to put some numbers behind that, um, the state of California spends three times what the entire private foundation budget does annually. So we, we are relatively small. Um, secondly, to bring this to life is um, R&D budgets. There's not an R&D budget in the nonprofit philanthropic sector. Amazon, Amazon, just Amazon, spends $9 billion a year on R&D. Imagine if Anna, Alex Bernadette could use 1% of that, $90 million, what it could do to the platform she's trying to build to connect more people to mentors to help them persist through education. Um, and then the second reason um, I, that I don't think we've been, as a sector, been able to create really scalable, sustainable change is we've not done a great job in the handoff. So these 1,000 points of light that are doing extraordinary things, it, we don't do a great job of handing that off to a government entity where there actually can be scale and sustainability. So with that kind of dismal painting of the picture, I will start with Larry and ask a question. Actually, Hewlett, I think, was one of the thought leaders when it comes to outcome-based grant making. Um, you guys have done some extraordinary work, but I'd love to hear from you what you think are some of the opportunities and, and limitations when it comes to technology to drive philanthropy. Okay, so I, I do want to push back on Good. sort of the way you framed it. Uh, I'm actually thinking of writing about this. So the, the idea of 
big bets that disrupt when it comes to poverty alleviation, I think is just a fundamentally wrong way to think about it. These are really, really complex social problems. They have really, really complex causes. Um, they are things that you need to, we just spent a lot of time looking back at our 50 year history and one of the things that emerged really, because it's our 50th anniversary, one of the things that emerged really clearly is the places where we have had the most impact are the places where we have been working for 10, 20, 30 years, uh, slowly learning, changing, adapting, whether that's conservation, women's reproductive health, in any of those areas, whereas the sort of, you know, there, there aren't silver bullets that are gonna do things. The other thing about poverty is it is, Although there are some general pieces, it is very, very sensitive to local conditions. So there are not cookie cutter solutions as there are for many other things. You, there are broad approaches, but then you need to take them and tailor them in the particulars and for the particular context. And that also takes a lot of work. So with that, I do think there is an important role that technology and especially data collection and big data can play. Uh, and it runs across the gamut. So if you think about it, you can break this process down into three pieces. There's policy design, there's policy implementation, and there's policy monitoring. And you need to do all three of those things if you're gonna have any success. When it comes to policy design, there's two pieces to that, right? First is actually understanding the problem, and second is understanding the causes and, and the things that might produce change. So, so data in particular can be tremendously important in big data now that we can get it in understanding the problem and getting a real description of, of how things are going at a much more discrete level than we've been able to in the past. And especially, I love this, I was raised in a world where we were taught that data mining was bad. You weren't supposed to do it, but you can actually, with big data, you can, you can be truly agnostic on relationships. You don't have to start with limiting hypotheses and just explore a whole bunch of things and have things shown to you that you wouldn't otherwise find. So data is hugely important for that. It's not important, it's not really particularly helpful when you get to the second part of that though, which is understanding the causes and thinking through how to do that. You need theory for that. Theory is necessarily value laden. Um, it, it's a mistake to think that you know, some sort of technology is just gonna give you answers. The, that, that piece of it requires a whole different kind of thinking. When it comes to policy implementation, technology in particular can be tremendously important. Um, you know, I think you guys did give directly earlier today. That's a, a really good example where you can use a mobile app to get, you know, you're testing a hypothesis, you're getting get the money out in a way that would be really difficult without the technology. The mistake people often make though is confusing implementation with policy design. And that you can do something doesn't necessarily mean it's a good or a right thing to do. So again, you can't escape politics and ideology and theory. Uh, and technology won't let you do that. And then policy monitoring, of course, again, it can be tremendously important there. In fact, the, the biggest benefit that you get from both technology and policy on the monitoring side is the ability to get feedback much quicker than traditional surveys allowed so you can learn and adapt and adjust in a way that, that was just never possible before. So there's lots of opportunities there, but at the end of the day, you know, you need to understand the community, you need to get buy-in from local policymakers and the policymaking community. You need to do all of the difficult things that, that, and you need to be patient and willing to take the time and use this as a tool that aids, but not as a substitute and not with what I think is a really mistaken notion that, as I say, there's a big silver bullet here and if we can just find the right app, we can solve poverty. Yeah, definitely no silver bullet. So, um, Daniel, when it comes to this idea of R&D and, uh, foundations and organizations like yourselves funding you know, risk capital mm -hmm. to enable organizations to take intelligent risk. What, what, if anything, is Tipping Point doing, or what's your perspective on that? Well, I, I would just like to agree with everything Larry just said. Um, I it think never it's, happened. Yeah, no, I, I, I was told that it might not happen. Um, awesome. Uh, yeah, that was the humor part. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, it, this work is always about people. Right? It's about our communities. It is so incredibly difficult what Alex is doing at Beyond 12, what Jay Banfield is doing at Year Up, what um, the 44 groups that Tipping Point's investing in. Those 44 groups have to understand the community. They have to dig in. And we, you have to, as a funder and as a partner, stay with them for the long term. So um, no amount of technology, no matter how great, I, I remember an entrepreneur who had started one of the great video sharing apps of all time that we all use today, told me, um, you know, I did this in 11 months, why can't we figure out 
fighting poverty in the Bay Area in a similar amount of time. Um, I think he's come around and understood now in his old age of mid-30s uh, that it's, it's much more complicated. Um, so having said all that, R&D, uh, $145 billion a year is spent by the corporate sector here in this country, uh, almost zero as you mentioned, Meg, is spent in the philanthropic sector and the nonprofit sector. Tipping point, our budget annually is now $22 million is what we're grant making this year. Over the last three years, we've spent $4.5 million on R&D, helping Beyond 12, helping uh, uh, Ray Fust, Ray, who we heard from earlier, uh, and also Year Up, scale these solutions. We have to give these great leaders the seed capital, the R&D capital, to try and risk something. Because um, we know that what they're doing is working on the ground. Um, I know Jim wrote a paper uh, about big bets, and Year Up was one of the examples, right? How is it possible that we don't give Gerald and Jay and others at Year Up that risk capital? And so for the last few years, we've been trying to embed that into our core grant making. We had something called T-Lab. Uh, which was our incubation wing of Tipping Point, We've, we think it's so important that we are now rolling it into our general grant making. We are going to be making philanthropic bets on R&D projects at our high-performing, you know, high-functioning nonprofits that we're supporting. So we're excited to, uh, to be pushing that movement forward in the philanthropic sector. Excellent example. Emmett. Um, you sit in perhaps one of the most powerful philanthropic seats in Silicon Valley. And um, Megan Smith, I think, mentioned that what, one of the things the White House is trying to do is to enable the technologists to be empowered and, and do good. How do you see Silicon Valley Community Foundation playing that role and trying to influence, the, especially the technologists who are highly concentrated in this area, to take their assets and their talent? Yeah, so. We're seeing a philanthropic renaissance in our community. And, and one of the challenges when you disrupt a paradigm is that how do you get outside of the box? So what do I mean by that? We see philanthropy as giving to a nonprofit organization. And once you create that box, you sort of you, you limit the kinds of solutions. So let me talk about housing. It's just one example. We all understand we have an acute housing crisis that's affecting everyone. I would argue to you we can't solve the housing crisis by philanthropy making a grant to a nonprofit. The scale is just too big. It's just, it's just, it's just too big. And so you've got to engage with government in public policy to change the priorities understand that one of the reasons why we have a crisis in California is because we cut off the redevelopment dollars back in 2008. So I, I think, you know, to Larry's point and Daniel's point, sometimes we look for a technology application or we think philanthropy can solve some of these fundamental problems. And those pro it can help. It can make efficiencies, as we saw in the last panel. It can do a lot to move things on the margin to make it better for people. But the idea that we're going to make a grant that then does something that just magically changes some very fundamental structural challenges is a problem. The second thing I'd just like to share is that philanthropy is asleep at the switch when it comes to even thinking about technology. So as a sector, we're, we're not aware. And there are two different pieces to this. I would argue, at least two. One piece is the piece of how do you get nonprofits to adopt the technology that's available, whether that's big data, whether that's pushing text messages to clients, just very fundamental, easy, low-hanging fruit things to use tech. Just the applications. The nonprofits are behind, and it's, and it's, and it's not just because they don't have the capacity. I would argue that it is a leadership problem. When, when the leaders don't tweet, they don't Facebook, they don't understand YouTube, they don't understand big data, they won't make those investments, those arguments in the board, because what they know is the traditional annual report that goes out. 
So that's one set of problems. The other set of problems is understanding that this technology transformation is disrupting every aspect of our country. That it is creating a level of economic insecurity. There are big, giant issues of what happens when we actually have driverless cars going around and, and those jobs go away. Testing is going on. They're already doing things in Europe with trucking. Right, huge things. If you haven't been following what's going on with IBM and Watson and healthcare, right? Very soon, I won't need a cancer specialist because my d data can just run through the computer and spit out pretty much what the diagnosis is and the treatment. So will health insurance pay a premium to have a cancer specialist looking at you? There are huge disruptions that we're on the cusp of. And philanthropy ought to be raising the questions, asking what the options are. But we can't do that if the leadership of philanthropy is unaware to even know that that's going on. So there are two buckets that we've got to grapple with. And we had a conference, Silicon Valley Community Foundation, back in October. We gathered people from around the world in philanthropy. And their lack of basic knowledge about the trends and the opportunities that many of you just take for granted, it was eye-opening to them. They just walked away saying, really, that's going on now? So we got a long way to go in just educating philanthropy before we can expect it's going to play the leadership role that's required. Can I just, can I just clarify, because you said the, the nonprofit leaders are behind, and yes. then you were saying the philanthropic So I think actually it's incumbent on us as funders and us as foundations, and I think you were saying this in your second point, because it's not fair to ask the nonprofit leaders to, to be advanced fair. when they're on the ground no, doing really no, hard work. Hold no, on, hold on. It's fair. And we don't pay for it. We no, should, we should pay fair. for it. Let, let, so. let, let me give you an example. And, and I know that's an easy answer. No, but, I, I'm not but, trying to get applause. No, no, no <laughs> I know, but, but it is a philosophical point. People ask me for things all the time. I have never been asked. I need a $3,000 3D printer so I can make shoes for the homeless, so they can get shoes that fit. I've never been asked that. So it is a mutuality. It's not that I own the answers and the power and right. you don't, and you're, you, you have no agency. You have agency to ask and make the case, and I have agency to support. It's a both and, and to put it all on one as being it's on you, and I'm just here doing the work, so I can't think big. I think we need to and ought to expect more of nonprofit leaders, and we need to and ought to expect more of philanthropic leaders. And, my sec and to your last point, that's what I expect. I yeah. expect more of the foundations. Absolutely. Which but I we also have not need been leaders on the nonprofit side who want to do it, Absolutely. who understand it, who I will push their staffs to yes. do it. And I can't tell you how many leaders I meet with who say, you know, all this technology <laughs> stuff is a fad. Yeah. Right. Can I, can and I, I want Larry to jump in this. Well, I, I mostly want to jump in. I, first, I just want to. I, Agree with everything. I want to draw a distinction, See, though. The distinction, <laughs> I know, the distinction between how we can and should use technology to improve what we do. Mm -hmm. That's one kind of problem. And the, and, and the other kind of problem is understanding the ways in which technology is going to change how we need to work. Mm -hmm. Those are distinct things. Now, what I would say is I, I kind of agree with Emmett that philanthropy is way behind. When I started at Hewlett, my very first, very first day on the job was a retreat with one of the programs. And they were, it, was, it was our global development program. God, they're going to kill me for this. And, and they were talking, you know, and, and everything that we were thinking depended on all sorts of assumptions about labor markets and where jobs were and so on. And I, I just raised my hand and I said, you know, have you guys thought about robotics? And then the room kind of fell silent and they went, uh-huh. Anyway... Right, and, and, and so part of that is because it's so big and so difficult. Now, I do want to note, though, that we are not farther behind than most of the rest of society. So there is a technology community that, not surprisingly, since it's what you do, is, is up more up on this thinking than most people. But it's not as though philanthropy is lagging any more than most of the private sector, uh, most of government, and so on. So, and that's because it is happening so fast. Um, to me, the, the, bigger, the bigger problem is, is, is thinking through how is the development of AI, as in some ways the best example, going to change how we're thinking about all of the things that we're thinking about and, and, and how do we adapt to that? Right? And so that is a huge problem that 
it's not a question of money. No matter where you are, you need to be thinking about that. And then if you need money to help figure it out, obviously we should be providing it. Um, by the way, I am going to open it up to questions from the audience in a, about five minutes. So I'm guessing a lot of you probably do have some questions because I'm, I'm loving the controversy already. Um, so one, one other general question <laughs> to throw out there is this idea. And by the way, I've been really inspired to see the number of public sector leaders in the, who've attended this conference. I feel like they, that there's more than I've ever seen before. And that leads to me to my question about this, this opportunity or this gap that I think exists between the philanthropic sector and the public sector. So when extraordinary things, you guys are, are we are investing in extraordinary things, how can we do the handoff effectively to a, 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 the public sector that really does have the funding and the scale to make it part of the infrastructure and the, and, and the norm? Do any of you have examples? I, I have examples of partnership. In San Mateo County, we have an early literacy uh, program called the Big Lift. It's focused on third grade reading. The County of San Mateo has devoted uh, tax dollars to that initiative. The philanthropic community is involved, and the private sector community is involved. And it is a true public-private partnership, and we have social innovation fund dollars from the federal government to match. So. It is a very effective uh, uh, program. The, the challenge and why it's so unusual, everybody's trying to hand off to somebody else. Mm -hmm. So quite frankly, a lot of uh, local governments that I meet with, and we've got a lot between San Jose and San Francisco, they say, well, we want to partner with you, but what we really want to do is have you take on more of a burden in terms of funding it because we want to lower taxes. And you have philanthropy saying, we've got this innovative idea, and we were the risk capital, and we want you to scale it by making it part of government. And no one fundamentally wants to pay for it long term. Hmm. And so part of the challenge to me, particularly in a new uh, in a federal environment, is I'm not sure where those partnerships happen at the federal level, the action is gonna be at the local level, but there is such pressure by voters, by the, and this is where the civic education comes, nobody wants to pay for anything. So even when there's a crisis of proportion, right, in Palo Alto, uh, the voters refuse to create senior housing. And there's a crisis for, for seniors living in that community. So, that, that's the, and, and philanthropy can't fill that gap. We can help try to educate people, but I, I think partnerships are getting rougher because everybody wants to hand off and say, see, we scaled it and you, you do it now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> in, uh, in San Francisco, we just had a ballot initiative to put $50 million into more service for the homeless, and everybody supported Jay, uh, I believe was the, was the ballot initiative. They said, yes, let's do it. And then K was the actual tax to add the 50 million, and everybody said no to that one. So uh, to your point, yeah. people want to spend money. They just don't want it to be their own money. Um, we are, at Tipping Point, embarking on, um, it, we're in the early stages of working, uh, partnering, working, prodding, pushing the city and county of San Francisco um, on this issue of chronic homelessness. And we've studied the Santa Clara model. Um, we have been in talks with over 75 different entities inside the city and county of San Francisco, which, by the way, has a $9.7 billion budget, larger than 13 states. We have 1,700 chronically homeless individuals that are living on our streets. They are dying on our streets. It's something that is exploding nationally, but all around this region, it is the number one crisis that we face. Um, and so we, are, we know a tipping point, no matter how much money we raise for this initiative, it, won't, it will not fill the hole that needs to be filled, and it needs to be filled by our county of San Francisco. Mayor Lee has made it his number one priority. Um, I know Mayor Schaff has been here most of the day. She also understands that this is one of the top issues in Oakland. So uh, Tipping Point's gonna try to bring in the things that we've learned in Santa Clara County from Abode and, and from Palantir and all those. So we're excited to partner as a philanthropy, but in this case, actually, we're gonna push hard and, and be that third party that comes in and says, okay, are you spending your dollars wisely? Because currently, it's probably somewhere in the $500 million a year that we're spending on our homeless issue in San Francisco. 
And that might be underestimating it, right. by the way. And per the great example we just heard of before this panel, there does seem like there's some opportunities where the private sector has come up with a solution yes. where that can save, it's cost savings for, for everyone. Yes. Uh, so, Larry? Yeah, so Emmett uh, identifies one problem, which I think is a real problem. I do think there is a potential solution to that, which is actually still relatively new and needs to be worked out better, but the social impact bond, mm -hmm. you know, provides a mechanism for saying you're already spending on this, but we can show, we'll invest to show you that we'll actually save you money if you do it this way, so it'll be a diversion. Um, but there are two other problems that I think get significantly in the way and are really the, and almost impossible. So one is most decision making at government, local, state, or national is not particularly evidence-based. And so showing people that you have a good solution doesn't matter when you get into the both bureaucracy and politics of the way in which resources are being allocated and the way in which policymakers are constrained. And then second, even if you can get past that, is political polarization. So we're also in a world where even if there is the evidence and people accept it, if it doesn't fit the ideology that, that is you know, prevailing in, in the, whoever is in power at that time, they're just not gonna do it. And we have a separate program we call the Madison Initiative, which is about attacking Political polarization, I know that sounds insane. Um, but the argument was, if we don't solve this problem, we are not gonna be able to even begin to address any of the other problems. You can't address income inequality, if, which is gonna take government action if government won't act, period. And having the right idea is of no use And when that's the situation. So you need to deal with all of those political problems uh, before you can really begin to think about handoff. Um, all right, well, I'm gonna throw it out to the audience. Do we have a microphone roving around? Okay, one second. And if you don't mind saying who you are and where you're from, that would be great. By the way, Meg's fun fact, if Marion is still in the room. Is Marion still in the room? Oh, she yeah. She would have stepped out. Well, Meg wanted to go work for Marion Wright Edelman right I, out of college. She I did. didn't, though, so I think you should tell Marion why I will, you desperately. That was my dream job as Children's Defense Fund. <laughs> Maybe she, she'll still hire me. All right. Okay. okay. Good afternoon. Thank you so much. Um, my name is Carla Mays. My company is Mays Civic Innovation. I'm also an impact fellow at Singularity, working on exponential smart cities, um, talking about equity focus. The issue is, you know, we've had several presentations today on minority funders, I mean, uh, minority innovators and entrepreneurs. And I know, I, you know, I'm one of those folks that always struggles with funding. You can win the hackathon, you can win the con competition, but being able to find funding to take those, those things forward is a real challenge. And being able to connect with philanthropy um, to be able to have a, even a project account mm -hmm. um, to be able to move these, these, you know, these projects forward is a challenge. And is there anything that can be done about you know, really helping um, innovators and entrepreneurs from this community? I'm in San Francisco, I'm often here in the Valley. Um, even trying to get a project account is very difficult. You need to, you know, there's the chicken and the egg. You need to raise $25,000 so that you can even have um, that fiscally sponsored project. So I was wondering, wanting to know, is there being something done around that or is that something we can work on? Who would like that? I'm, I'm happy to speak at least uh, to part of it. It goes back to how you define the box, right? So how, how are you organized? I mean, are you a for-profit setup or a non-profit setup? Because, because right, part of the grant-making challenge is once it's a grant, by law, I'm restricted to sort of a nonprofit avenue. So my ability to get outside of that is very limited. And that's why you see a lot of the philanthropists uh, creating LLCs. So they aren't limited to doing good by having to give a grant only and through a nonprofit organization. They can fund public benefit uh, LLC, uh, public benefit corporations and other kinds of vehicles that are outside of the, the, the one box mechanism. Most of the projects that I'm talking about um, dealing with either here in, the, in Silicon Valley or San Francisco or Oakland, we're all doing civic tech projects or projects that are there, they are nonprofit in nature. I'm not asking in yeah. nature. The law doesn't allow me to say no, no, in no, no. nature. I mean, are you structured not, as a nonprofit? No, they're structured. They're, they're meant to be, they're, the, like a city will throw a hackathon, 
COVID for America, gents, you know, I've, you know we've, we've won these things. We're not looking, we're looking to be able to have a chance to scale these in a nonprofit and to grow, you know, these ideas. Just like Tipping Point, you know, where you have the lab, we're looking, you know, there's innovators of color that want to be able to take these, these things forward, and we're not given a chance to be able to do uh, that. I, I think there's two different issues that you're raising, both mm -hmm. of which are problems. So one, which is what Emma was getting at is, forget profit, nonprofit, legal structure. If the form of what you're doing is not what we're familiar with, then you're not gonna be in our networks, and, and so that's, that's one issue. And that's, you know, that's really to the yeah. earlier point, like, you know, it's true, even, even in funding nonprofits, we often have in mind a kind of traditional kind of nonprofit doing traditional kind of work. Um, second is the issue of minority organizations, minority run organizations, and that's a problem not just for technology solutions, but across the board and in every field. And I mean, I can say I know we are, and I think a lot of, we're rethinking how we do our grant making. In some sense, it's the same problem, which is to say the networks that we are familiar with, the places that we're going to find the people to give grants to are structured a particular way and, and have demographics that fit a particular thing. And as we did in hiring back in the 70s and 80s, we need to step back from that and rethink how broadly we're gonna reach out and expand our networks. And that's, I mean, we need pressure, we need contact, although I think we're kind of aware and trying, and I think broadly as a sector, the sector is beginning to come around to the need to do that across the board. And social innovation are going like we're the innovators. How do we work with? Yeah, but you? so you got a double whammy. Yeah, because right? we're we're trying to we're trying to work with you all. You guys are saying like, okay, we don't know. We, you come here to Silicon Valley. We're having programs like this. And believe me, I, I like it. Tons and tons of friends that just turned down coming today because they were like, okay, we're going to talk about this again. Are we ever going to be able to like you know create? Is is there a working yeah. relationship? that we can have on moving this issue forward. So, I, I, if I can jump in. So the last year and a half, we've been tackling this issue head on at Tipping Point. We've talked, we've written op-eds, we've talked about it, we've gathered employees at, at Tipping Point to think about how we change our grant making, how we put uh, you know, race, class, and equity you know, a lens onto our grant making. We need to get beyond just talking about it and we need to act, and so Tipping Point is actually very committed to this. We have a team. We actually have three proposals that the team is bringing to the leadership team, and it, it's a huge problem. And to be quite, I'll be honest, as a, a white leader of a philanthropic organization, when you talk about philanthropy, it's mostly white-driven, right? Um, I woke up to it in the last couple of years, and it took, it took too long, right? It's taken us all way too long. Yeah. The, you know, we're talking about mostly people of color. Yes, absolutely. And if we're not the innovators, the, the innovators of color aren't allowed to be building solutions yep. and running organizations or, or you know, or, or it being in the space. Yep. So it's like, how do we be in the space with yeah. you? Although, there, again, one other distinction I think it's important to bear in mind, which is, so putting a, a diversity, equity, inclusion lens, there's a difference between on top of the work that we do, which we do not do, versus on top of how we select the grantees in the areas in which we are working, which we are beginning to do. And so you still have the, well, who are the funders who fund what I'm working on? Mm -hmm. You have a triple whammy. In fact, there's a lot of funders who, it's just you're not in my strategies, so you know, that's just all there is to it. Then you're in my strategies, but the way in which you're working, I'm not, I don't know how to integrate that because we haven't done that kind of work. And then there's the, you're not in my networks because most of the networks that I'm connected in are majority. And so all of that needs to be dealt with, but it's important to keep the things clear. Thank and you I would for just add that, that we're about to yeah. have uh, an RFP, uh, several of them, in honor of our 10-year anniversary. But uh, one RFP will be in civic engagement, and we'll be making two $100,000 grants in, in that space. But it is for organizations that are primarily focused in San Mateo and Santa Clara counties. So you know groups in that space. Also, if I could just, yeah. I don't want to misrepresent Hewlett. It's not that we, those issues are not a part of what we do. They are, but the areas in which we work were defined by the beginnings of the foundation and by our histories. So, so we don't sort of, we're not going to change the way we work in order to change that particular, so. So uh, Elizabeth, maybe this is a good conversation as a follow-up. Where's Elizabeth? <laughs> Wherever she is. Okay, so uh, thank you for that There's important voice. Um, I think Elena is next. Hi. On? 
on. Um, hi, I'm Elena Harkness. I'm a research fellow in urban development at the Brookings Institution, but I'm on leave from the MacArthur Foundation where I ran urban development grant making there. And so I want to put that hat on for a second and ask, um, I, I spent a lot of time funding civic technology as sort of a means to the end of better urban development and community development grant making. And as a grant maker in that sector, really saw that it was very hard for a lot of the civic technologists who I think here see themselves as a field that's really supporting many of the issues and ver you know kind of program verticals that all of us care about um, to get the kind of core operating that they need to move their field forward. And I can imagine a point in time where you know we have civic technologists embedded across education, climate change, healthcare, all the traditional ways that we sort of as philanthropists kind of frame and fund the problems we want to work on. Um, but it's really been hard to get kind of core funding for this field, which is, I think, critical infrastructure to solve the problems that, you know, Emmett, you were talking about, the sort of de deficit of skills that we have inside mm -hmm. of technology. And I think that's really, that's really true. We need to figure out how to bring that expertise to bear. So my question is, in a field that's very organized around clear issue verticals. How can philanthropy do a better job of supporting you know, this critical platform infrastructure around data and technology at a time where it's probably going to be pretty transformative? Maybe not forever, but certainly now. So let, let, me, let me go back to something I tried to say at the start. And I know it's not a popular point of view, but I want to push on it and give, an, give one quick example. When I sit down with a nonprofit leader about what they need, Right? They're in my space, they're in my bucket. And I said, what do you need? If they're saying I need a technologist, then that's what I try to figure out how to do. Right? I, I, I want to be supportive of what they're saying they need. I've yet to be in that meeting where someone has said to me, one of the key things I need is this technologist who's going to help my organization do X. Now, you talk to Anthony Romero, who's at head of the ACLU. Anthony is going around saying he needs a geneticist now because of the issues around DNA and who owns it. He's going around saying, I need a software programmer. But, so he's asking funders for these areas that are outside because as a leader, he's come to understand to do his work, he needs, he needs those people on staff. So it is this reciprocal relationship that when I'm sitting down with someone, right, so you're not the overbearing foundation to say, I'm going to give you what I think you need. You start off with saying, tell me where you think your opportunities are. And you have that discussion. So I do think there is this need for education on both sides of this equation for how the value proposition is. And then having examples of saying, when I brought these people on, this is the value that we got out of, out of doing that. This is the work we did that we wouldn't be able to do before and why it's valuable. And then that serves as a proof point for other nonprofits and other foundations. Any other comments to that question? I, you know, I, I can't resist. I mean, there's two, again, two different things. Both are problems. So one is, again, what Emmett is discussing, which is to the extent individual organizations need things. And there, the problem you run into is most funders aren't like Emmett, right? They're just like, what are the exact costs you need to run the project? I'm not giving you anything to build the underlying infrastructure, the so-called overhead or indirect costs. And that is a huge problem. We do mostly, two thirds of our grants are general operating support, but but it's unquestionably a problem. An even bigger problem, which I think you were getting at, is there's some infrastructure which isn't organization specific, but is just general, which would be the, the sort of equivalent of roads. And there's no capacity for that, none at all. Um, we have trouble with that as it is, or even not forget technology, but think of the difficulty that there is funding things like Center for Effective Philanthropy or the Foundation Center, the, the core data that we need to even understand what we're doing. It's nearly impossible to get funders to step up fund that sort of stuff. So we just do it badly and there's... It, it's great to hear Hewlett doing two thirds and that's amazing and, and we, we're obviously a lot smaller but when you have, when, when we do our grant making we think about general operating support. So I think most funders should think about that when you're at the size of a Hewlett, two thirds is pretty damn good. 
And Jay Banfield uh, served up this extraordinary idea to me about six months ago, but this idea of creating this R&D fund. Like, what if every corporation in America put aside even 0.01% of their R&D budget towards an R&D budget for the nonprofit sector? It could be game changing. Um, all right, next question. Hello, my name is Roxanne. What? Oh, okay, go ahead, sorry, couldn't Hi, find Hi, my name voice. is Roxanne Mendes, and I sit on the board of an organization called Teens Exploring Technology, where we're a youth organization focused on ending the school to prison pipeline, so we focus on young men of color, but we use uh, technology as a tool, so we teach them um, computer science, and they build um, web apps. However, um, we've received a lot of uh, support from like local foundations and some tech companies, and we, they have great data points of 100% graduating high school and 76% majoring in computer science. But where we, we get a lot of the challenges are from those that work in the tech industry where comments are like, you don't serve girls, um, your work is malicious, or you're not serving girls, um, don't even think about applying for a sponsorship. And so my concern with the tech industry being so laser focused on the gender equality is that we're forgetting another population that is in much need of the young men of color. And I just wanted to know if uh, any of you can speak to that. I agree with you. I mean, <laughs> I, how can I, how can that's I mean I, I would ag agree with what Emmett said earlier, which is I think we are seeing a renaissance in philanthropy, and I do think we are seeing corporations starting to get this issue, the issue that you just brought up um, more. We have a long, long, long way to go, um, and it's not going to happen at conferences like this. It's going to be happening by programs like yours pushing every single day. This is why these issues of poverty, these issues of, of violence in communities, these issues that were the prison, you know, the school to prison pipeline that we talk about, we have to stay at it day in and day out, week in, week out, year after year after year. So this is not a simple solution, but I would say that I am optimistic that corporations are getting, at least here in the San Francisco Bay Area, I would say they are starting to hear the message and are starting to act. But we need to keep pushing. Everybody in this room needs to keep pushing. So I appreciate that you're pushing so hard. Next question. Yes. Well, I feel maybe I should defer to Elizabeth. OK. Um, hi, I'm Christina Halper, and I'm the founder of All Star Code, which does work very similar to Urban Text. And actually, Oscar and I have been talking, and there's interest in young men of color in tech. I can talk with you about what we're saying. Uh, but my other hat is actually as a philanthropist. I'm on the board of our small family foundation called the Reginald F. Lewis Foundation. Uh, but as a result, I wanted to follow up on uh, this woman's question related to her interest in getting investment. Uh, and if any of your foundations were looking at PRIs, program-related investments, uh, which, as I understand it, is um, a nonprofit actually out of its endowment uh, taking a percentage of their endowment, which of course is invested in a wide variety of places, uh, and taking a share of that and doing, say, angel investing, in which you could do in for-profit companies that are aligned with your overall mission. Do any of you guys do that? Well, no. Uh, but let me answer, <laughs> let me explain why. I, 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 you do a fair amount. We do so, yes. Um, but let me, so first, actually, PRI, the definition is it's grant dollars that you counted against the 5%. It can sure. be an endowment investment or not, but the core is that it's, so, so we don't, actually, it's funny, I just, it's But been it allows for for-profit in, in yeah, investing. Yeah, that's, is, that's the is key. The is it, and it's funny, it's been presented to my board three times, and all three times they've said, we're not going to do this. But the reasons are, are worth noting, because it's not because we don't think there are for-profit ventures that can contribute to producing social good. Clearly, there have to be. There are difficult problems with whether we are staffed properly or capable of identifying which ones will or, or, and which ones won't. But really, the, the issue for, for this is not that, it is, it, it's, a, it's a matchmaking problem. There is so much more money looking to make those kinds of investments than are finding it. Um, and here it's not foundations, you don't need us. I, I've given a whole bunch of talks in front of groups of young emerging entrepreneurs who, they haven't, as, as Emmett said, they haven't figured out the form in which they want to do this, but they are really interested in finding these impact investments that combine the two, and they just can't find the projects. And so the infrastructure to do the matchmaking is necessary. Our view at the moment is that as, in, in as much as money is not the problem, 
If we take our money out of for-profits because none of those people are investing over there, we're just gonna diminish the amount of money that's available for work that while it doesn't fully solve the problems, does a lot of good to do something where it's not our money that's needed. So we are doing some grant making around helping to develop and build the infrastructure so that people who that's what they wanna do can find it without using our own funds there because they're needed in this other sector where there's way too little. We're already starving most of those organizations as it is. And just quickly, our, our model, we have no endowment. So every dollar that we raise goes out the door each year, so. And we do some, but to, to Larry's point, it, we're not looking to make risky bets. We're looking to make bets that return value to the community and return the money back to the endowment so it can go back out. And, and you, we do have that fiduciary responsibility to say, People entrusted that to us forever. So if we make a bet with a group that we think is very limited in this opportunity for success, that's not being a good steward of the resources, nor is it helping get the community impact we want. So we're very selective, and those tend not to be the startup, we've got a great idea, help us out kind of investment. That, that's not one that gets, gets through. It's one that's seasoned, it has a track record, and you, and you have a reasonable belief, you'll get that return, you'll, you'll benefit, and you'll get the return, and you'll be able to recycle that and do it again. And if I could just add, I wanna sort of put your comment against the comment over here, which is, again, it's to bear in mind something that Emmett said at the beginning, which is we have nowhere near the resources necessary to solve almost any problems, right? And so it's not as though we just are sitting on lots of pots of money and why don't you do this, why don't you do that, why don't you do this? They're all good ideas, but there's, we have to pick among the good ideas, which is why, as I say, for us, it's sort of, you know, where, where will we have the most impact relative to other opportunities and other funders and what the field looks like as a whole. So before I start investing in PRIs and for-profit ventures and perhaps diminishing the size of my endowment so that I can do even less, in the meantime, I've got all these other organizations that are, that are doing good and, and they still don't even have enough money. And so we have to make all of the, those trade-offs. And as I say, it's, it's, so we think of it in terms of trying to help the people who have the money and want to use it, use it there. Amazing is the other money. Uh, the other money wants a return, whereas if this is coming out of the five percent of grant dollars, then that money is actually not allocated to never be returned. So conceivably, philanthropists could play a role in helping to leverage the private sector capital, which does want an aggressive return, and we all know how that money can put a lot of pressure on entrepreneurs. Yeah. So that's something that philanthropists could do because in the right way, there actually isn't a need for a return, of course, if you're balancing and allocating your endowment. Oh, that totally agree. Money. That's why PRI is it's grant dollars effectively, yeah. so it's, you, you have a zero expected return anyway. But again, there, is a lot of, there are a lot of philanthropists out there who are not the traditional big foundations, that that's what they want to do, and we just have to help them find their way to the investments with you guys. Elizabeth. So there, the last two days, there have been a lot of conversation about structure and scale. And obviously, the issue of scale has become particularly uh, current, given, I think, the, the sense that we re re really are entering a period of crisis in the country, not just because of sort of the disaffection you see um, that propelled this election, but also uh, we've seen some recent data on uh, immobility out of Raj Chetty yesterday, which was really shocking. Shocking, uh, you know, essentially a straight line down from 1950 to now in terms of whether or not s children are more likely to move up and out of poverty vis-a-vis uh, -vis their parents. So we are clearly at a, a, a tipping point um, in in our country, and you know, one of the things that's very clear, and Steve Ballmer talked about today, was that there are structural barriers, very clear ones, to moving good ideas to scale. And at the same time, uh, there are very good ideas out there that should be scaled up. Philanthropy has a role to play there, um, both in sort of shifting the incentives to the government pots of money, but also to the way nonprofits are funded to actually be able to get to the point where you can ask the critical questions about who should you be hiring, what should you be doing, instead of it being stuck between barriers and silos of how can we actually make rational decisions. And I'm interested in your thoughts on how can philanthropy actually help flip incentives so the incentives are aligned with the need. 
All right, so we, that's the last question. We're at the end of time. So I'm going to give you, you guys, the three of you, the option of either ask, answering Elizabeth's question or answering the question, I'm going to give you 1% of Amazon's $9 billion budget, so that's $90 million, to invest in a technology platform that's going to change the world. Choose one. You only have one minute to answer either one. Who wants to start? Daniel. Um, well, my... <laughs> My uh, data and impact head is here, Jamie Austin, and so he would definitely want some of the money. Um, <laughs> so I, listen, we, we focus on core metrics for our groups. So we have 44 groups, housing, education, employment, and health. Um, we don't ask them for 30 or 40 different points. We will ask them for four or five key indicators that will prove that somebody who goes through this intervention, goes through one of our programs, is on a pathway out of poverty. So. I would love to double down our budget on helping Jamie and his work on helping these groups and paying for these databases that we ask these groups. So funders need to pay for this data. And we shouldn't be asking for all sorts of data. We should be asking for a handful of things so that actually then we can measure. We have baseline data from last year. We have new data in that came in this August. And we're going to start collecting this data year over year and see how our groups are doing against their cohort and are doing against groups that are not in the tipping point portfolio. And then funders actually need to be willing to cut nonprofits that are not performing. That's actually where you can actually get to scale then. We should be funding fewer nonprofits and helping them scale up because there's not enough money to go around to every person with a great idea and good intentions. We all know that good intentions today are not enough. We need action. We need scalable solutions that are actually solving the problem. Larry? So, well, yeah, yeah. So, of course, I'm not going to take them. If I did take the money, I would put it into my endowment. Um, <laughs> because of what I said at the beginning, I don't know how many of you out there are philanthropists as opposed to, you know, um, either working in organizations that are looking for funding or whatever. But if you are, I, I resist that way of thinking about it. I mean, start with your problems. So if you're going to do philanthropy, you have to say, what are the problems that are worth working on? And if they're worth working on, they are complicated, and there's not single-shot solutions. So don't, don't approach it that way. You may, along the way, come upon some single-shot things that are going to contribute to your solution, and by all means, invest in those. But, but you have to think about it that way, so which takes me to your point. And what I would say is um, it explains, I think the answer, at least for us, has been it explains the shift that has taken place generally in philanthropy over I don't know, the last decade or so, certainly while I've been in it, which is increasingly to advocacy. That is to say, the problem is we have lots of solutions to lots of problems. I mean, we do a climate as our largest single commitment. It's an area in which we absolutely know what we can do to solve this problem. It's affordable, it, it's technically, and, and the problem is all about getting government to move. And so you have to figure out different ways to move government levers because evidence and good ideas, while necessary, are not sufficient. And that, I don't know any other answer than that. Emmett, bring us home. So philanthropy is, is shifting. And, and I agree with both sets of comments. We're going from a, a time where we used to spread it around to where it's becoming more narrow in focus, fewer organizations, and bigger bets. And as a result, then, it's much harder for new things to get seed funding to get proof of concept. Uh, and philanthropists, I think, are starting to go longer, to Larry's point, in their willingness to stay with something. So, right? So, stay with it. First failure, OK, learn from it, retool. I've made the investment. I want to see what you recover from that. So rather than the old model, well, you didn't do so well, I'm going to shift to somebody else, they're willing to go a couple of rounds of, what they, of learning failure <coughs> to stick with, which also makes it harder for new people to come in. Uh, I'd love to take, take that slice of Amazon money, and I would really invest it in uh, a wholesale national civic education campaign to have people understand this technology is not a fad. It is a massive disruption to every facet of our life. And what do we do when we don't have enough jobs for people who want to work because we have robotics, we have AI, and that no one wants to talk about it, and yet it's happening. And that's underneath the economic insecurity and angst 
that people are voting right now. It is a tectonic shift that everyday people do not understand. And that is driving and increasing the poverty and inequality. And until we can name it and talk about it, I find it very hard to think we're going to get to a solution. And so that's how Excellent. I use that. Well, join me in thanking these terrific panelists. Thank you.